Good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome to the Mile End Institute at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, my name is Patrick Diamond. I'm director of the Mile End Institute, and we're delighted to welcome you this evening to this panel discussion on structural and institutional racism in the UK and contemporary perspectives. This session this evening is going to be chaired by my colleague, Dr. Nivi Manchanda from the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary. And we will also have remarks from um, a stellar panel who we're going to introduce fully in due course. Before handing over, let me just say that the Mile End Institute is the lead research institute at Queen Mary, which works on issues across politics, public policy and history. And we run a series of events. If you'd like to sign up to our um, mailing list, um, details will be put in the chat during the seminar. So do sign up for our events. In terms of this evening's event, as I said, it's going to be chaired by Nivi. I'd like to introduce her this evening before I formally hand over to her. So Nivi is a senior lecturer at the School of Politics at Queen Mary, which she joined in 2017. She previously worked at the London School of Economics and the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, and she completed her PhD in 2014 from the University of Cambridge, where her thesis titled Imagining Afghanistan, the History and Politics of Imperial Knowledge Production was awarded the best PhD dissertation in the arts and social sciences by Claire Hall. Her book, loosely based on this research, is now out with Cambridge University Press and has won the LHM Ling Outstanding First Book Prize awarded by BISA. So um, you're in very safe hands this evening, and I'm delighted to hand over now to Nivi, who will chair this evening's seminar. Over to you, Nivi. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so as Patrick has said, we have an excellent panel, each of who will speak for about seven minutes. Following on from this, the discussion will be opened up more broadly. Please feel free to ask a follow-up question to each panelist if you would prefer this approach. If you'd like to ask a question, use the chat box or Q&A function. You can also tweet us at mylandinst. Okay, so firstly, we'll hear from Sadia Akram. Sadia is a lecturer in political theory at Manchester Metropolitan University, and her research is concerned with debates on agency, focusing primarily on the role of the unconscious and its interplay with essential capacities. Over to you, Sadia. I think you're uh, still muted. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much to the Mylan Institute for inviting me today. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and to, to speak to this topic. Uh, the Sewell Report, um, I mean, uh, so the Sewell Report published in March, uh, in March this year, I mean, where to begin, really? There's, there are so many things that are deeply problematic about this report. Um, uh, uh, and I'm not sure in the space of about seven minutes I can I can cover them all um, but um, I want to uh, I want to address some of them and, I, and I'll, I'm going to note the particularly glaring um, kind of issues with the report as I see them uh, before before saying uh, before going into kind of some of the issues that that a better report would have looked at uh, and before making some more broader some more broader points about um, structural and institutional institutional racism here in the UK. Um, I mean, some of the, the, the more obvious problems with the report, as have been noted by, by many commentators, are the, um, the very selective use of data and research that was used in the report, um, the extremely poor use of sources, um, and, uh, and I'd say, but but, mo but one of the most uh, pressing issues is the complete neglect of decades of scholarship on the issue of, um, uh, of structural, of institutional racism, uh, but also the hard work that's been done by, uh, by you know, various grassroots uh, movements, uh, as well as think tanks on this issue. So you kind of, you know, my, when I saw the report, I kind of thought, well, you know, uh, which planet were the people who wrote this report living on when they when they wrote it? Because it seems as if, as if it's been written in a complete vacuum to broader discussions about structural and institutional racism in this country. You know, if you read the report, you'll see um, a focus on issues such as family breakdown, um, on um, geographical inequality, 
and what we might call a cultural deficit uh, a cultural deficit model sorry a cultural deficit model of the differences between ethnic groups um, highlighting how some ethnic groups have performed better um, uh, perhaps because of their attitude um, um, to uh, to kind of uh, self development whereas others have performed uh, less well uh, because of their um, uh, because of attitudes um, um, and that kind of pitting of ethnic groups against each other is deeply problematic. So overall, without getting into the detail of the report, I would say that, uh, and I'd encourage anyone who hasn't read it to actually have a look because I think it's actually, um, uh, it's really quite shocking really, but overall in terms of my assessment of the report, I would say it's deeply, uh, it's ahistorical, um, it lacks the lived experience of different ethnic groups, um, and um, and then is deeply politically motivated and is a deeply politically motivated report. Um, so so given that, I, and I'd say that you know having looked at the report on the one hand, I um, and I think the context to this meeting today is to is to think about the um, um, is to think about the the articles that were published in the Progressive Review. Um, so articles that were written by um, uh, the uh, uh, that were collected by the IPPR and written by Rota and, and REF, you know, they provide some of the rich detail that is missing in the report, uh, detail on the um, inequality in housing, inequality in education, um, issues to do with um, uh, the police service and stop and search. Um, and I think it's really important to have that detail, a detail which is kind of conspicuously absent from the actual sewer report. <clears throat> I mean, if we if we reflect on the report, I think one of the most the most pressing issues in this report is the um, the complete rejection of institutional racism and um, and a rejection of uh, structural racism as being real kind of issues in in the UK today. Um, and I think that's a deeply problematic. Uh, position uh, for a, a government report to take. Um, and I would say that, <clears throat> you know, as the, the articles in the in the uh, in progressive re review suggest, it's it's so important that we recognize the value of uh, a notion such as structural racism and institutional racism. But I would actually go further than that and to say that um, uh, in my own research, I think it's really important to think about, well, you know, um, what do we mean by the notion of institutional racism? If you think about McPherson, if you think about um, the, McPherson report, the McPherson report in 1999, it obviously looked at the very, the kind of how institutions work and the, the real effects that they have. So we can look at with the Windrush scandal, we can look at stop and search laws as real examples of how institutions negatively affect um, uh, people's lives. Um, but I'd say that the, the, the concept of institutional racism is, uh, has, uh, is a really complex notion because um, as, the, um, um, as the theorist um, Mary Douglas says, institutions don't think. You know, so when we have explicit examples of where institutions are racist, such as stop and search, we can say, right, okay, there's the problem. Um, you, you get rid of that policy and you'll get rid of a factor that contribute, contributes to racism. But if you think back to the McPherson report, it was, it was revolutionary in saying that even where you get institutions which are, you know, on the surface, good institutions such as education or housing, which may not have explicitly racist policies, but then it's the outcomes that we see where we, it's, the outcomes of those institutions where you see racism. So if you can't draw a line between an outcome and a policy, then where does that leave us? And I think that's what the kind, that's why I find the notion of institutional racism uh, so important, but at the same time, really perplexing. Because if we're not going to move to a kind of individualist notion of, you know, well, let me put it this way, if uh, institutional racism was focusing on institutions and not agents, I'd say that, you know, there's a real issue there because institutions are made up of people, but institutional racism is a concept that was devised to move beyond the notion of individuals as, as being the problem and think about how institutions 
uh, perpetuate inequality. So I think that we still, you know, in some, I would say that we absolutely must think about institutional racism. Sorry, that's my time. We, sh we must focus on institutional racism. We must focus on structural racism, but there's still lots of questions there to think about the relationship between individuals, institutions, and social structures. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Adia. So our second speaker is Shardia Briscoe Palmer. Shardia is a lecturer in media, race, and social justice at the Montford University in Leicester. And her research specialisms intersect across the politics of gender, race, and social injustices. She currently teaches within the Leicester Media School, a second year module on race and media, exposing the discriminatory and influential nature of the industry. Shardia works closely with the Stephen Lawrence Research Center at De Montford University, where she supports the mission of the center in creating inclusive intergenerational research communities with, which address world-led innovative research on race and social injustices. She's a strong advocate on why and how race and its inter intersections must be addressed adequately in the discipline. Over to you. Hi, thank you um, very much for that introduction. And also, you know, thank you for um, Myland Institute for inviting me back um, to, to speak on this topic because it's, it's very, um, you know, it's very significant and fitting. What are we about six to seven months on from the, the publication of the, um, you know, the SIL report? And, um, you know, Sadia has given us a really good um, introduction into where we are and, and, and what those, those frustrations and, you know, now the challenges, it's almost like the report gave us, has given us new challenges um, to, to address. So, you know, I'm going to I'm going to briefly touch upon kind of the report and what I feel um, where, where, along with many, many others within um, academia, um, are the problems, but also look at kind of where it's now left us and, and what we what we now have to do um, or redo. That's what it feels like. It's been done a lot of the work that we've been working towards for a very long time. Um, so the, the what, what I see right now, or where I feel we are, is that there's been a lot of there's been a lot of movement. There's been a lot of movement over the last eighteen months, you know, almost two years, um, and then especially within the last six six months with the report. But even though we can see people, institutions, and you may want to say attitudes moving and traveling. It's almost like they are moving towards the unknown. It's like a lot of people actually do not know what they're trying to accomplish, but they know they need to keep to keep this debate, to keep this discussion to moving. And sometimes I, I'm finding that when I'm speaking to, to colleagues that are not necessarily um, within the, the, you know, the, the discourse and the narrative around race um, relations and, 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 and injustices, they are not quite sure exactly what the purpose of their movement is doing. Um, and I say that in regards to, you know, I, I, I resonate really closely in, with what, um, you know, Maurice McLeod has um, published in, in, in their findings, but also what Sadia just said about this whole idea of now we're in a, a culture war um, where, you know, people are being, you know, put up against one another. We've had the ethnicities being set up against one another. And it's almost, you know, in a sense where it's a, a, a blaming game. Well, we did all right. Or, you know, we've, we've got the same um, disparities of you and we've, and we've turned out okay. But in all of it, it turned, it turned our attention away from the actual problem and the root causes. Um, what, I, what I found is that now we're in a, 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 a cultural position of toxicity where it hasn't got rid of the racist, it hasn't got rid of racism, it hasn't changed structures or, or you know, institutions to where it needs to be. In fact, it, the report itself for me has generated a, a, a kind of, you know, what you could argue a tokenistic feel to what actually needs to be 
you know, a more passionate, really understood, comprehensive um, movement towards, you know, social and, and racial um, justice amongst, you know, so many of us within within the UK. Um, you know, bringing up kind of my 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 research and my position in regards to intersectionality, I can't ignore that as well, and the lack of that acknowledgement within the report, um, and the way that you know, you know, communities were categorised, and you know, there's no overlapping, and there's no understanding, and again, comprehension around the intersections and how that, or the intersections of individual community groups, and how that again, you know, potentially has um, a role to play in particular disparities, achievements, or underrepresentation. Um, as well, you know, I, I, what the report has left now is, is almost a legitimacy to be able to have particular conversations and play certain narratives. And, and this is where the media comes into play. And, and you know, the, the media doesn't hold account or isn't, is it, you know, held up to responsibility more than a, you know, far enough how they should be. But the, the, mild, the media, as we, we, we fully know that, it's a very powerful tool in itself is institutionally and structurally racist. And, you know, what the media, you know, fuels is this, you know, racially, racially charged narratives and cultures and attitudes that actually have only just, and along with the report now that, you know, now legitimizes some of these conversations, it just maintains that lack of political, um, you know, action that we needed to see and also it 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 it, it weakens the the efforts that those that have been fighting for social change and justice both personally and within our careers have been doing for so many years we're now in a position where we have a government or you know legitimate authoritative piece of paper piece of research which in you know that in ourselves um for many of us really really gets us going when it's called it an appropriate and, and you know piece of research um, that says actually no, no no it's not racism it's because of who you are it's because of your attitude it's because of your culture and it just as you know Sadi says it just wipes decades worth of scholarship and hard work and activism right right down around the, the drain and you know by the media kind of again fueling and, and providing some type of legitimacy um, in the way that it reports such in, instances and it's still doing it and you know it's you know we can't ignore for example the 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 racial madness of the euro 2020 and what happened there with the, the black footballers um, and it's, it's not about me going into whether they missed a penalty or not that's not this at all but it's the reaction that happened afterwards and um, you know, I'm I'm not a, a, a football person, but my, I did watch the penalties. And as soon as they missed, I turned to my husband and I said, watch Twitter. It's almost like I knew what was about to happen. And Twitter in itself was, it was, it was probably an accurate depiction of the wider society. Um, and I, I, I would probably argue that in the regards to, you know, platforms like Twitter and you and your Facebook and your social medias, you know, they give people the autonomy to be to feel safe enough to say and and, and do what they they want to do. Um, you know, and, and felt that people were it was okay um, you know, to to go on and start using certain racial slurs and and it just it ends up going up on one. I think the report, even though looking at institutional racism, it, it, it has a rippling effect to to racism in general and racist. And I, and I feel that, you know, six to seven months on, the report has, has done very little in regards to tackling the actual in-depth issues within our country. What we're seeing at the moment is surface level. When we're seeing people now, um, or institutions, academic institutions start to hire more, um, you know, people of color, even that term alone, that needs addressing quickly. But um, you know, hiring more BAME, BAME staff and so on and so forth. Everybody's you know ticking their boxes, at the surface level. But the 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 root cultural attitudes 
on the day-to-day -day people, the people that are running these institutions that work in the departments that we all work in. Their attitudes have changed, um, you know, and, and a mass scale for us to actually notice the difference. So, you know, that's just kind of my initial um, thoughts and in, 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 in insight and in, in feelings. And obviously I'll, I'll contribute a little bit more as the, the evening um, goes on. But yeah, I just wanted to kind of end where media has a massive role to play um, in, in kind of where we are and where we go next. And um, I'll, I'll talk about it more, but I think kind of looking back in historically is also going to be a really important um, aspect to enroll to start to, to embed into, um, you know, the, the next, our next steps. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, up next is Daniel Frost. Daniel is a visiting research fellow here at the Myland Institute, and he's a PhD candidate at the University of Reading. And he's researching activism in Croydon in the 20th century. His work focuses on the politics of place and space, bringing attention to the ways in which activists have experienced and understood their immediate surroundings. Building upon his studies into black youth activism in Croydon, his future research will focus on the history of police monitoring units and related groups in London in the 1980s. Thanks, Nivi, um, and thanks to the Myland Institute for putting on this event and to my fellow panelists for taking part. I'm grateful for this opportunity to respond to the Progressive Review special issue, Producing Injustice, um, brilliantly put together by Race on the Agenda and the Race Equality Foundation. As you said, I'm a historian working on activism in 20th century Croydon, and I hope you'll allow me to respond to some of the issue's pieces by drawing upon a few historical points of reference. So 2021 is a year of important anniversaries. It's 10 years since the nationwide uprisings following the police shooting of Mark Duggan. Whilst rioting took place in Tottenham and Brixton, it was their spread to outer suburban areas like Ealing and Croydon, which caused most alarm. Distinctive images associated with the 2011 disturbances, notably the burning of the famous House of Reeves furniture store, were from Croydon. Contrasts made with the uprisings in Brixton in April 1981, another of this year's anniversaries, commonly understood today as a political response to police oppression and inner city deprivation. As Ru Park observed, media betrayals implied previously respectable suburbs were besieged by marauding hordes of swarming youths, typically delegitimized de by comparison to 1981, although some commentators, including Darkus Howe, by 2011 living in Croydon, made the comparison more favorably. For good or bad, with justifiable cause or without, 2011 seems to suggest that black anger had been unleashed in London's outer suburbs for the first time. This narrative misrepresents the histories of suburbs like Croydon, including Croydon's 1981, when local activists reported regular racist violence associated with drinkers at the Wilton Arms in Fulton Heath, where the National Front was headquarters. Shortly after the Brixton uprising on 1st June 1981, a group of black young people gathered in nearby Melfort Park to plan a counterattack on the pub, during which a teenaged white bystander Terence May was killed. The subsequent Croydon 15 campaign on the defendant's behalf included activists from Race Today like Howe, and locals Femi Adelaja and Winford Jameson, who, after another meeting in Melfort Park, established the Croydon Black People's Action Committee in a squatted town centre building, later awarded funding from the Greater London Council for a police monitoring unit. Whilst these events received extensive coverage amidst growing alarm about the intrusion of the inner city into suburban Croydon, they have been little remembered. Uprisings in other spaces like Brixton are treated as unsurprising and compared favourably to apparently exceptional violence in supposedly suburban Croydon. Yet, if, as Joshua Verasami points out in the Progressive Review, youth revolt is our shared history, that is a history which should include outer suburban London. Already in disarray and heavily criticised by race today by the time the GLC was dissolved in 1986, however, the black youth organisations which it supported in Croydon have left little trace. This was apparent in the way the events were remembered 10 years later in 1992, when an Afghan refugee, Rahul Aramash, was beaten to death by a gang of white youths in Fulton Heath. The Labour councillor G. Bernard addressed a protest called by the Anti-Nazi League. She said her own son was almost murdered in that identical spot in 1981, likely the incident described in her grandchild J. Bernard's poem, At Last We Were Alone, and then declared, racism is not an isolated incident. The colleges, the schools, the council, and all the bureaucracy of Britain is racist, and I am not ashamed, ashamed to say that because it is what it is. She's earlier been the first black councillor on the London Education Authority, she demonstrated precisely the system's literacy of systemic racism, which Sajib Lingaya described in his piece. By 1992, however, even the Conservative Council had sponsored an ethnic minorities forum and other speakers emphasized Croydon's status as a multicultural suburb. 
a forum representative criticized the insidious racism that has been creeping into the hitherto harmonious relationships between all the peoples of Croydon and praised the police specifically, whilst Aramesh's uncle argued that the Nazis represent only a tiny minority. Whilst, as Les Back pointed out, the incident suggested that suburban racism remained, activists' claims to speak on behalf of Croydon involved a lot of citizens' literacy. Moreover, all of the speakers, including Bernard, spoke consciously as adults and as parents in the place of the younger activists of the early 1980s, which I think is relevant in context of the growing attention that's been placed on family structures, alluded to by Mahay, Levy and Butt, and also mentioned tonight by Shadia, and troubles the relationship of older activists to the younger Black people uh, described by Virasani. Neither the earlier disturbances nor Aramesh's killing have usually been mentioned in coverage of subsequent incidents of public racism in Croydon, including the 2011 racist tram woman viral video, a 2017 attack on a Kurdish asylum seeker, and 2018 burning of an effigy of Grenfell Tower in South Norwood, or a 2020 attack on a pair of uh, acid attack on a pair of Eritrean asylum seekers. Nor have these incidents or the 2011 uprisings usually been connected to Croydon's long history of National Front activity, nor to the town centre's Home Office Immigration Headquarters, which is a symbol of Britain's internal border and what Verisami calls the single consensus state. Whereas Lambeth's Ted Knight famously described the police in Brixton as an army of occupation, Croydon North's Labour MP Steve Reid, who was elected in 2012, condemned the mindless hooliganism of the previous year. Croydon's image has changed considerably since the 1980s, locally born Stormzy, whose face graced unofficial Labour posters in the town in 2017, plastered Croydon place names across the stage during his Glastonbury performance two years later. Croydon's changing demographics have been closely linked to Labour's contemporary success, yet the borough has never had a Black or Asian MP, and despite Pride and Stormzy's success, it's a difficult town to find a venue for bashment, grime or drill. Ten years on, people are more comfortable celebrating local Black musicians and considering the 2011 uprisings and their causes. I want to suggest that Croydon's 1981 and its absent memorialization can tell us at least three things about Croydon's 2011 and its 2021. The London suburbs have long been a, a front line in Black British history, not confined to the other spaces of Brixton and Tottenham. An emphasis on the innocence of those involved in public disorder can detract from adequately remembering the situations to which it responded, undermining what Lingaya described as systems literacy. And the claim of the multicultural suburb, which is almost like a spatial version of the Sewell Report, continually forgets and disguises the systemic racism and public violence which have always permeated the suburban nation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daniel. Okay, we will now hear from Alba Kapoor, who is a senior policy officer at the Runnymede Trust. The Runnymede Trust is the UK's leading independent race equality think tank which generates intelligence to challenge race inequality in Britain through research, network building, leading debate and policy engagement. Thank you, Alba. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's so great to be part of this panel and to be talking about this. Um, I'm actually going to start by talking about a different report, which was um, our report that we published in July this year. Um, so we published a submission to the UN's Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination on the state of race and racism in England in July. Our submission was put together alongside 80 other leading charities and organisations across England. We investigated inequalities in the criminal justice system, education, health and employment. And we concluded that racism is structural in England. In fact, we said racism is systemic and that legislation, institutional practices, and society's customs continue to combine to harm Black and ethnic minority groups. As a result, in England today, Black and ethnic minority groups are consistently more likely to live in poverty, to be in low paid precarious work, and to die of COVID-19. Um, we concluded as well that the inequalities are particularly acute for Black and ethnic minority children, who make up half of the child population in prison, 28% are Black, and are more likely to experience excessive use of force and restraint in the criminal justice system than their white counterparts. It also came out the week following the, ra the vitriolic racist abuse uh, facing black football players as part of the Euros 2021. Um, and combined, the events of that week once again gave commentators a reminder that institutional or structural racism might exist in our society the mere utterance of which was met with widespread resistance. Responses from those who disagreed centered around assertions that in fact, the ethnicity pay gap is not as it seems. 
that the rate of hate crimes that we mentioned and that were recorded as part of the submissions that were given to us are in some ways in exaggerated. And that Runnymede's, Runnymede in its collation of the evidence of over 100 leading civil society organizations in the country had conducted a fundamentally flawed exercise that cherry picked the worst data. The response that we saw to our report reflected something that we saw in the CRED or Sewell Commission report too, an, ins an insistence that whilst racism might exist in our society, an excessive focus on the worst data wrongly would lead to the view that structural racism exists. Um, a good example of this in the Commission report uh, is the claim that education is the single most emphatic success story of the British ethnic minority experience, which seems to ignore the embedded realities in school systems uh, that, that show structures are different from att selected attainment statistics for Black and ethnic minority groups, that Black Caribbean students are six times more likely to be excluded from school than their white counterparts, and that UK schools have recorded more than 60,000 racist incidents in the past five years, which by the way, is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and from our perspective, the data is clear to see. Black women are four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. Young black men are 19 more times more likely to be stopped and searched by the Metropolitan Police and their young white neighbors. Uh, we did a report with the Institute of Public Policy Research early last year, which showed that if white people were to experience the same death rate as black people during the early part of the COVID-19 crisis, 58,000 additional COVID-19 deaths would have occurred. But daring to say that racism is part of the structures of society, of our society, that it is built in the fabrics of our society in consideration of the evidence is seen as a threat. A threat to recognize that what is needed to respond to structural racism is structural change. Um, that recognizing outcomes at school influence outcomes at work, that recognizing inequalities in housing has an impact on in health, that recognizing racism in our society cannot be reduced to individual action demands structural change. Um, and Sanjeev Langaya, who has been mentioned previously in this, puts it really well in his article in the Progressive Review um, that uh, structural racism, the notion of structural racism is often rejected because of the scope and scale of change that it demands. Indeed, and I quote, it demands a fundamental rethink about how we organize and distribute society's resources, benefits, and sanctions. Recognizing structural racism means recognizing the scope of the change that it demands. It means go going beyond talking about dismantling the hostile environment. It means looking towards transformative ju justice. It means transforming our education system. It means drawing the necessary connections between race and class, uh, recognizing that with the exception of Indian and Chinese groups, black and ethnic minority communities are more likely to live in the 10% of overall most deprived neighborhoods. And the meaningful res responses require fundamental restructuring and redistribution of resources. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more as the panel goes on, but I'd just like to end by saying that it's really vital that this conversation is happening now, that more than a year on since Black Lives Matter protests swept this country, um, seven months on since the Seal Commission report has been released, it's really important that we're having a conversation about how we talk about systemic and structural, structural racism as activists in this space, as organizations in this space, because in order to, call, to talk about structural racism, we also have to be calling for the urgent change that's needed and recognizing that call. And it's also important because of the challenges that we are facing currently um, these inequalities are not only becoming more entrenched, but upcoming legislation is at risk of making them worse. Um, I think of the proposed electoral integrity bill, which risks disenfranchising black and ethnic minority communities. I think of the police crime sentencing and courts bill, which is now notorious for threatening the right to protest, as well as the rights of gypsy Roman traveler groups. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there um, and I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you so much, Alba. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody to use the Q&A function to ask your questions. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to invite our final speaker, Vanessa Pierre, to make her remarks. Dr. Vanessa Pierre is a consultant physician in genito urinary and HIV medicine and the clinical lead for sexual health at Bart Health NHS Trust. She's also an honorary senior lecturer at Queen Mary University of London. Vanessa is passionate about reducing inequalities in healthcare she has made this a central focus of her clinical work and received an NHS 70 Windrush Award for her contribution to improving health equity. 
She has a particular research interest in participatory approaches and the intersections of race, gender and health. Over to you, Vanessa. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's it's been great just to listen to everyone's viewpoints um uh, we're all aligned which is why we're here um but it's it's great that we're having this conversation um and i obviously couldn't be here without speaking about the report in terms of health health inequalities but also you know our largest employer in the uk the nhs so i just wanted to highlight some things and some reflections that we had um I had as, as an individual, as a black woman that works in the NHS, um, but also um, as um, someone that advocates for um, equity across the NHS and listening to colleagues as well. And I think that, you know, as a clinician, I'm really aware that it's witnessing firsthand the manifestation of longstanding inequalities in health and determinants of health, seeing that roll out in COVID, knowing that it was built on long-standing inequalities um, that could have been um, could have been mitigated, could have been addressed, but weren't, and then we saw it manifest. I'm always really clear that we can't get away from that emotive aspect of that when you're responding, when the report came out. But I feel that there are some definite objective um, uh, arguments that um, were not put forward and were minimized within the report. Um, and again, as many of you have so eloquently said, is that the the there has been so much robust learning before this that seems to have been dismissed or minimized as well. But I think just knowing with health inequalities um, and knowing that they're driven by multiple factors that overlap and interact in multiple ways and so you can't disentangle um, from class from um, socioeconomic status from gender um, from um, whether if someone's living with disability it all feeds together to exacerbate um, uh, someone's opportunity but the key thing is is that all these factors interact to cause a differential opportunity for healthcare access, treatment and management. And what is clear and what is definite is that these are shaped and heavily influenced by the policies within the NHS. And so when, we, when we're clear about that, I, I, as someone working in it, someone that is extremely proud to work in the NHS, find it difficult that we say that there is no, in, there is no institutional racism that is driving um, health inequalities. Now, the NHS is a complex network of providers, commissioners and regulators, etc. And I think that only by reviewing how these systems function and interact can we really hope that we're going to identify and eradicate, you know, the causes of um, racial inequality that we see. But the, the, I always say that the NHS from its inception was framed as a universal service that was available to everyone equally. But the key thing is, is that like many structures, it was built for the majority and not the minority. So to, to, to provide the care that is needed for the minority, you need to have targeted um, interventions and policies that meet those needs. And yes, there have been um, attempts to do this, but these have not succeeded. And so this is why we still see these inequalities that we see today. And, you know, when the NHS first started, you know, 1948, short staff positions were filled from um, staff from um, so-called UK colonies and former colonies. And so the NHS actually has been more racially diverse than the UK population itself. And so whilst um, the report, you know, said and celebrated um, this diversity, it also, um, to me, ignored the lived experience of many ethnic minority health workers and the wealth of evidence that says that working in the NHS for these groups is at best unequal and unfair. And it's simply the progress has not been made there. And when we look at other elements of um, structural racism within the NHS, um, a recent um, survey by the British Medical Association, which was um, submitted to the commission, I may say, 
it found that 16.7% of ethnic minority staff compared to 6.2% of white um, ethnicity staff reported experiencing discrimination at work from a manager, team leader, or other colleagues, as well as um, reporting twice the level of bullying and harassment. And there were race disparities in the pass rate of postgraduate exams and unequal opportunities to progress to more senior roles. And then when we look at how, um, and again, I give a acknowledgement and shout out to uh, Dr. Lingai's um, review um, where, you know, where he says, you know, it takes a system. It truly does. And within the NHS, you have clinical commissioning groups um, who are the main commissioners of um, HIV, uh, sorry, HIV, sorry, stuck in my um, specialty, NHS care. Um, and they actually are required by law to have regard to inequality. Um, in their work and to shape local services um, to ensure that everyone um, has opportunity to um, access and have good health. But a recent systematic review has clearly shown that CCGs have not prioritised tackling health inequalities and um, this is rather often seen as a public health duty rather than core commissioning work. And then I think um, the last thing that I wanted to um, highlight as well was that um, I found that within the report um, where it talked about evidence of um, race discrimination, it, it, it focused on, indiv in, on individual cases rather than a pattern of um, systemic um, and structural um, discrimination. Um, and I've mentioned some facts before, but the NHS is privileged that we have a workforce race equality um, team that um, does create um, a standard to be clear about what are whether there are patterns of race discrimination. And within those reports, it's clear that it does exist in NHS recruitment, promotion, development, discipline, and as I've said, in bullying um, as well. And um, the when you look at the um, composition of um, the senior leaders within within health, um, you see that you know across NHS trust boards, 10 only ten percent are from a, a black or minority ethnic background. Um, those of white ethnicity, when applying for certain jobs, are one point six one times more likely to be appointed for shortlisting compared to those from racially minoritized groups. So there's definite evidence there that um, there is a, um, a, a pattern of difference that warrants acknowledgement. Um, and I, I think that's the key as well. And I, I said lastly, but just to add this in, um, the authors suggest that the experience of racial bias is a, a matter of um, perception. And they say that, um, I, I can't remember the page, I should have written it down, but there are some simple HR activities that can address these perceptions. But there's not even a hint in the report of what these simple HR activities activities are. And um, I think that we when when that's reported, it it's clear that there are no simple approaches. It is it, it requires a systematic and sustained process to respond. And I and um, as someone witnessing it and supporting people within that, um, I think that is is crucially important. So I don't bring all um, uh, doom and gloom in the, within it, within the NHS. I think there is an increasing commitment for change. But I, as I say to all my colleagues, this has to be intentional and relentless for us to see the improvements in um, uh, health equity that we want to achieve. But I think that the NHS is a, a, could be a fantastic system for us to see this change and to really, really advance health justice as it, at its core, at bringing together health equity and justice for us to change in society. Um, so I'll end there, but really looking forward to the discussion after to talk about the, everything more in more detail. Thank you so much, Vanessa, and thanks everyone. Those are really thoughtful and thought-provoking um, panel, um, panel comments. So moving on to the discussion and the questions, we have about 40 minutes and there have been a few questions on the Q&A and a couple have been emailed to us. So. I'll just group some of them together because they seem kind of similar. So one of the questions we've had 
is what do you think the report could have done better? And I guess a sub question is, do you feel the system is too broken to, to fix? And then another person's asked, and they're anonymous, um, whether each of the speakers could perhaps offer one practical policy proposal to address the problems that they're discussing. So I'll stop here with those questions and then do another round. Um, feel free to jump in or we can go back in the order that we started with. It's up to you. Yeah, go ahead, Vanessa. I'm happy to, I, I just finished speaking, but <laughs> uh, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I, I think um, I've often reflected about what do you, you know, the, the question is what, you know, what, what could they have done better and um, how could it have been put forward? Um, I do, um, not just because um, Alba's here, but I think, um, you know, the running media report and the way that they approach things, you know, could have been a better way of um, the wider report doing it. I think the Runnymede report um, response was a really powerful um, tool. But I think when you've got a, for a personal note, when you've got a report like this in in such um, uh, difficult, in, in a very difficult and complex context, there's a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of responsibility in language. There's a lot of responsibility in acknowledgement. I think that um, if there were if there were a statement that if they didn't feel something, they the data that they um, that informed that comment should have been clearly articulated, and then rebuttal should have been put in, and then actually I feel that there should have been. Um, a, a draft one that was created and then sent to the stakeholders that were involved to then review and rebut. Um, because again, you know, as someone um, living in this society of color, to see that report was extremely damaging. Um, and again, I'm I, I, I'm not making it fully emotive, but I think I can bring emotion and I can bring fact and I can be objective. And I think that when you are in those positions and you're trying to engender trust, you're trying to engender trust in a time when you're bringing out vaccines, you're bringing out change and you're trying to bring people with you. That responsibility means that every word that you put out there, um, every approach that you put out there has to be robust and has to be um, uh, appropriately discussed with stakeholders and just giving it that um, weight that it needs. Um, that's just my initial um, reflections. Thanks. I'm, I'm happy to just come in now just because yeah, what I say is so closely related to that. Um, I think, I mean, it's important to say that the consultation exercise that existed before the commission came out, um, I think a wide range of race equality organizations took part. We did not see our submissions reflected in that. You know, there were lots of organizations um, that were part of uh, the broader, had a, had a stake in the broader issues facing black and ethnic minority groups um, and, and weren't, weren't part, they weren't consulted adequately in a way that, that what they were saying were conclu was included in the report itself. And I think that's a really fundamental thing that when a report purports to talk about the sort of key issues facing black and ethnic minority groups in the way that the commission did a response let's not forget to black lives matter protests that happened the summer before this is really important that this was this was the definitive response also following um the disproportionate impact of black of covid19 on black and ethnic minority groups uh, which is was devastating and um, this this being the response is is really, really, that's what shocked so many people from our communities, um, that this was all that this they were able to offer. Um, and it wasn't that recommendations didn't come out of the report, um, but it was that the way in which the report dealt with the issues of structural and institutional racism uh, did not seek to fundamentally engage with the history that came before it, which, which was about the very true realities of uh, institutional and structural racism in our society. Um, and then I thought on the sort of other question around um, a, a 
policy proposal and set, set of recommendations um, rather than a list of grievances. Um, so the Running Me Trust, when we published CERD, um, our kind of response to the commission um, sought to do exactly this. So in it, you'll see over 60 recommendations which outline clear steps that the government can take um, to respond to the challenges facing black and ethnic mi minority communities today. Um, just, I mean, some of them, uh, which I can pick out now include uh, proposals to introduce automatic voter registration, uh, which in light of the um, electoral integrity bill that's coming up uh, is really important. Um, it's really fundamental that political participation is talked about meaningly, meaningfully. Um, also, we did a lot of work on the criminal justice system. Uh, we urged the government to implement uh, the recommendations from reviews like the Lamy Review, the Angelini Review. They've been there. They have really clear recommendations for change, but they didn't. Um, and I can put, I will put, this is just a few, but I, I'll put um, the link in the chat the, to the report as well, because that has a clear list of recommendations for change. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. You carry on. Are you sure? Um, so I think I wanted to answer the first two questions kind of together, which is that firstly, um, the report wasn't a failure, the SOAR report's not a failure, the SOAR report has done what it intended to do. And similarly, the system isn't broken, the system is working as it's intended for the people who, for, it's working in somebody's interest, right? And it's important to think of systems literacy, not just as the ability to notice where a system has cracks or is broken or damaged but in whose interest is the system working who benefits from the system who doesn't the system it's not just noticing the cracks in the edge right it's it's like it's doing something and it's working for somebody so is it too and do i think it's like too powerful for people to overcome i think no i think that i'm not that pessimistic i think i was reading some of sadia's work earlier and i think this kind of we can have a boundless uh optimism about the fact that people continually do resist, people do point to better futures. Um, and I guess similarly with the question around the policy, I push back against uh, the idea that we have like a policy solution. I think we have a political solution, System systemic inequality needs system change. And I guess if I was to think of one question, it would be, what can we do to make uh, black activism possible? What, what makes black activism in the power? What has it made it possible and successful? And I think that um, Alba's already raised the threats to to activism from uh, the, the the police the, the, the crime bill and and um, also around the franchise and these are the kinds of things that make it putting aside the question of what people at the top should be doing with policies these are things that make it possible for activists to challenge them and get those uh, get those wins and that's where I would kind of what I would emphasize is is, is less of like a policy change at the top and more what enables systemic change? What enables activists who struggle for that? Thanks, Daniel. Sadia, do you want to? Yeah. Um, um, I think that there's a kind of a real failure to understand the nature of the problem here um, um, by, by the current government. Um, you know, if you think about the context in which the report was written, it was written, uh, it was researched over the course of 2020. So it was reflecting on Windrush, it was refre reflecting on, it was apparently reflecting on the um, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, uh, uh, it was it was reflecting in its own words on, um, and this is the terminology that the report used on disparities in, in, um, um, in uh, race and ethnic, in, in ethnic groups in the UK. And I think that, you know, reading the report, report you know, given that kind of set of problems, um, uh, if you read the report, there's a real optimism. There's a real optimism to the report uh, and a framing of these issues as um, to do with mistrust, to do a failure with recognition of, in perceptions of the nature of the problem. Um, and, um, and I think if you, you know, when we look at this, when we look at the, the report and, it, you know, if you think about those issues of perceptions or the reports kind of assessment of the problem, um, and then you look at its rejection of structural and institutional racism, um, its diagnosis of the, the nature of the problem. I mean, um, one of the kind of takeaway lessons I take is that the report very much focuses on a kind of individualist ideology of individuals make their own lives 
um, individuals progress their own lives and you know those who work harder do better and it should be no surprise to to many of us that those kind of principles are um, uh, kind of central to conservative to the conservative ideology um, and I think that uh, Given the nature of the problem we have, if you if you take if you take that kind of an individualist problem, you're not really you're not asking the right kinds of questions, and you're certainly not going to come up with the right solutions to the problem. Because as has been kind of you know uh, discussed here today, the problems are deeply entrenched. They are structural. They are institutional. And it's only when you apply that kind of a lens um, that you will we will get further. We will be able to tackle these issues rather than taking a kind of um, individualist approach, which I think characterizes the civil report. Great. Shadia, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, I'm in agreement to what, um, men, you know, many of the, the, the panelists have said. I also want to add that, you know, within, from an academic perspective within research, there was a quick turnaround for research. And in general, you could, you know, you argue that the, the quality of the research in itself is, is, is problematic solely due to, to how, how, how big a scope it was trying to research and how quickly it was done. But also, you know, if this report could be seen or even presented as an initial um, assessment or analysis on the problem. And then the policies recommendations that come out would need to be from a more um, substantive, you know, longer um, exploration into the, the, the issues and the challenges and, and the analysis of the disparities. Um, you know, what was missing from the report and probably wasn't taken um, as, as significant as it may have should be was the, the qualitative, qualitative aspect, the lived experiences. And, you know, it, you can say, you know, but we don't want to take that individualistic approach, but actually when you take the experiences of many who are therefore showing patterns and, and themes and similarities, that then has to be taken into consideration. And I think, um, you know, that was, that was missing. And you could argue that was missing because of how quick the report was, was kind of put out there and that, you know, time and, and actual attention would have give, um, you know, platform and, and space um, for that kind of um, analysis as well. And, you know, in regards to um, policy recommendations, we have to be careful as well about that because then it becomes, you know, 10 policies and once they have been tick boxed again, it, everything's fine, it's sorted and we move on. And actually it's a, it's a progressive, we're all learning. We're all trying to hopefully, you know, deal with, there is an issue that we're all trying to address and, and come up with things. And I think kind of just to put a list together on how you fix it, um, you know, the problem wasn't caused within a few months or even a few years. This is, as we keep repeating, this is, historic and it, it's, it's a legacy to be honest the position we're in the system that we have is a legacy that purposely was built for as Daniel said what it was supposed to be built for it's not actually failing it it's doing what it should so I think a tick a, a, a list of policies or a tick box exercise I don't think that's the best way to address the issues um, either thank you okay. Okay. so we're getting a whole bunch of questions I'm going to Take three and feel free to address all of them or one of them or none of them. I'll just open the floor back to you after I read these three questions out. So the first one is, how can we ensure an intersectional approach so that, for example, Black disabled people who have been severely affected by COVID-19 are not being left behind? So that's question one. Question number two is, to what degree do you think the great progress pushback being spearheaded by the Tories, the establishment and large swathes of the white English population in England is connected, to, is connected to increasing economic insecurity. And to what degree do you think the unfolding economic damage of Brexit will exacerbate the, that pushback on progress? Or do you think really this goes back to an imperial hangover of supposed racial superiority as legitimizing the civilizing 
in invasions, etc., and a deeper inability of post-imperial England to admit to historical crimes. Is England fundamentally, in majority of terms, simply a culture lacking compassion, charity, and respect for the other? The third question is, how do you think these e issues should be addressed in schools, particularly in regards to education and history? What do you think can be done to encourage the government to make changes in the school curriculum? So there's three quite different questions about Britain's place in the world, about intersectional approach to black, black disabled people, especially in health, and then also um, schools and curricula. Are you okay to yeah, please start in? Yeah. yeah. Um, again, and I know it's probably again me repeating myself, but as an academic, there are there are there are academics, there are researchers um in in you know institutions and foundations like Runnymede, like Stephen Norwich Research Centre and so on and so forth, that that's whose whole um research and scholarship themselves use intersectional frameworks and are very confident and capable and competent in applying such intersectional um, approaches onto research. So not just in regards to now that we have a report, what do we do from an intellectual perspective, but even the choosing of who um, did the, who, who, you know, was at the lead in the report, for example, the research design, the methodologies used, and, and even, you know, significantly the analysis of the report all should have been through an intersectional framework. So therefore, people like, or, or those that identify as, um, I don't know, a black disabled um, woman, for example, you know, would not have necessarily um, been left out or be continue to be, to be um, left out. And then in, in answering the um, question about school and education and, and you know, Work has already been done. Work has previously been done before the report. And that's that's where we, we have that conversation around scholarship and efforts and, and, and activism that happened before this report, or even before 2020 um, has, is actually being ignored in regards to kind of trying to get, for example, black history onto the curriculum. Um, and for example, um, with, you know, the, the, English literature, for example, there's a there's a um, paper and 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 you know information published on that in regards to looking at the um, including different in regards to English literature and what is taught to our young children from such a young age. So in regards to schools, it, the work is being done. It needs to be acknowledged and you know and taken forward. And embraced by those that are trying to, um, you know, make these footsteps or 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 or, or travel this distance. So that questions about, you know, what is getting done, is already known, but it's already known to those who who are who are researching it. But it's so it's others that also need to be um, part of that conversation and knowledgeable. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be really keen to talk to the sort of curriculum question because I think it's so urgent and important. Um, so, I mean, I think fundamentally um, the, the sort of question around representation in the curriculum in Britain is such an urgent one because this is a country that's really incapable of facing up to colonialism and imperialism and the way that it's shaped our history and migration today. Um, and we at the Runnymede Trust talk about teaching race, migration and empire in schools and what that means. But what that means not only for black and ethnic minority students, but what it means for everyone in a classroom, all of it, whom all of whom will have a history of their own in relation to migration to this country. Um, and I think that's really fundamental is that teaching race, migration and empire has a sort of impact on every school child, not just black and ethnic minority uh, children. Um, and this is something that we have been pushing for. Uh, we have been pushing for a mandatory 
um, module on migration on history histories of migration to the UK, um, and we've we've been doing that because it has fundamental impact on uh, on what happens to Black and ethnic minority communities. I mean, Wendy Williams in her review on Windrush lessons learned. Um, said that one of the things that enabled the Windrush scandal to happen was a poor understanding of Britain's colonial history, the history of inward and outward migration and the history of Black Britons. Um, if this gets taught in schools, uh, then we go some of the way in understanding how to combat um, these issues in, in, in the policy sphere. Um, and so I'll share some of the sort of work that we've been doing on this, but we're doing it in both the English and history curriculums. Um, and we need to look towards not only sort of policy changes, changes in the curriculum, but also how to support teachers to feel confident to talk about race in the classroom, to feel confident to talk about race, migration and empire in relation to history um, and to embed that into teacher training um, and, and those sorts of, uh, those sorts of uh, initiatives. Thank you, Abba. Um, can I? Yes, um, please, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say something to the the point about kind of Britain's imperial past and uh, is England fundamentally a culture lacking in compassion? And sometimes it does feel that way. I think I tend to think when I think of England, I tend to try and use my local example, which is Croydon. So we have lots of protests outside the Home Office against the national against the National Front racists who protest there and normally people chant something like Croydon is anti-fascist. Uh, you often get chants in London which is like London is anti-fascist and these are kind of strange chants when you think about it because Croydon is also where the National Front was founded in the 50s. So what does it mean? It, what does it mean to say it's anti-fascist? But it's still an important claim to make and as, as much as we can talk about kind of imperial histories, long histories of racism in Britain, there are also lots of examples of struggle against that and we need to manage somehow to hold both of those ideas in our head both the racist history and also the history of it being challenged and that's where I think keeps you away from the kind of pessimistic view that all is doom and gloom. On the curriculum point I think something to add is is the kind of we don't want like the almost new labour compromise situation where you get Mary Seacole onto the history curriculum and you get like Benjamin Zeph and I are into the GCSC poems and that's like enough. Um, some, to some extent, the idea of a singular national curriculum is part of the problem. It takes you so far and then stops and teachers need to have more freedom to, to, to design their own, uh, their own curriculums and to teach local, with local examples which are relevant to their students. But we also need to think about you know, I, I used to teach in a secondary school. There's a limit to how much anti-racist education I can do stood at the front of a classroom talking to students because at the end of the day, I'm the one who gives them detentions, you know? There, we need to think about the ways that education changes um, more than just what's being taught, but the, the, the relationship between student and teacher. And there was a lot of work in the 1980s around this, raising the point that sometimes if there's a, if there's a, a, a pupil who is, uh, white and maybe has racist views and they're probably also, often also white teacher stands in front of them and says that's racist it sounds the same as if you're saying you know you're naughty and it's not an effective kind of education so we don't want it needs to be devised in such a way that it's coming from the students themselves you know student a student driven curriculum and, and and not something that's kind of imposed um top down i think that can cause problems Thanks, Daniel. Um, oh. Yeah, Vanessa and then Sadia, is that? I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. I'm, okay. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I just think one reflection I just wanted to, to, to make just about um, the question about um, imperialism, etc. You know, we all know that imperialism is, you know, is an exercise of power um, and, um, that the, these power dynamics that and hierarchy that has you know shaped our nations and I don't and I don't think I, I think we should never underestimate that um, and um, it it patterns out in different individuals in different ways but one of the things the conversations that I don't think we have enough of is um, something that I talk about a lot is this um, that 
imperialism and that mindset brings on this zero sum, zero sum game continuously. And, and that's what pits people against each other. And I believe, you know, that's what happened in Brexit. And that's what happened in, in so much of our lives in which that a concept that I think is really hard to challenge, um, um, that there is, you know, a fine out finite amount of resources and opportunity and if one takes it then I'm definitely going to lose and I think that that happens um, within different um, racial hierarchies it happens within different racial groups etc and I think it's um I just wanted to reflect so I do think it's a, a conversation that isn't had enough about how we shift that mindset mm. of zero sum and and throwing that out there and saying that um changing that dynamic of how we interact with people and you, you know I, as I'm within the school of medicine and dentistry I've just taken on a role um, in equality diversity and inclusion and I don't know why it shocks me but it still does that um, this zero-sum thinking is prevalent so when we talk about inclu inclusion there is always someone thinking that is going to be at the, to the detriment of me and my career whereas instead of thinking actually um, opening up a space will allow someone in with diversity of thought opportunity etc and so I, I yeah it's a, just a personal reflection in terms of how do we challenge and approach um, that zero sum mindset thank you so yeah Thanks, Vanessa. Um, I just wanted to speak, uh, Nivi, to the question about intersections of race, class, mm -hmm. and gender. Yes. I mean, so much research uh, suggests that um, where you have racism, you will also have class inequality, you will also have gender inequality, um, you will often have gender inequality, and, and uh, it's not helpful, helpful to pit these, thing, these factors against each other. Actually, we see a consolidation, and then you see kind of multiple, multiple forms of deprivation um, consolidating the problem for people. Um, and I think that, you know, given that kind of widespread realization, um, uh, in the literature, uh, sorry, you know, in 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 broader society as well as um, in uh, you might say kind of uh, in government circles, um, it was really surprising then in the Sewell report to see a report which looked at uh, uh, ethnic disparities to kind of play out this uh, kind of conflict between class and race. Um, and so, you know, as well as saying that, um, you know, we recognize that um, certain ethnic groups um, do better and worse, we saw this emphasis in the report talking about, on the one hand, um, uh, you know, it, the, the report states 14, uh, uh, in the UK in 2020, 14.7% of families come from lone parent families, but that figure is made up of 63% 60, of Black Caribbean children. So you have that finding on the one hand, but then on the other hand, we also see, see in the report um, the kind of um, emphasis on white disadvantage, particularly in the, uh, in the Northeast. Um, so I thought, I think it's really unhelpful and it's really dangerous to do that kind of thing in, especially in government reports that, you know, class is so important. Um, but not um, and race is important. But when you pick them against each other, and when you say certain groups, um, uh, you know, such as in the northeast, are kind of uh, affected one way, and that, and you characterize other groups as being affected in another way, you're doing something really dangerous and something which which works against kind of social justice. Because we all know that where you have class inequality, you are often likely to also find. Um, kind of issues to do with racism um, and gender inequality. So of course we must take an intersectional approach, um, but it's really not helpful to pit class against race and or against gender. Thank you so much. Um, so if any of you want to jump in, um, if not, I have one sort of final question, which is actually uh, an amalgamation of a bunch of different questions that I've got both in this Q&A but also um, emailed to us and the, the thrust of that question is what do we mean by structural racism um, are there any concrete examples and and some people have also said that given that overtly um, this is something that Vanessa has also said about the fact that there are these EDI initiatives um, this example picks on 
mixed race marriages. I suppose you could talk about the cabinet and the fact that it's the most diverse cabinet, as they like to say. Um, what are the implications for um, for diversity sort of being folded into structural racism, if you like? So, or, or does that mean that structural racism isn't a thing, which is what some um, Q&A askers are saying? I mean, I, I'm happy to start in terms of the difficulty in um, people understanding or thinking, you know, what actually is structural racism. Um, and one of the problems is this is because there is no official definition of it. Um, and um, it's all of the closely related concepts of, you know, systemic and institutional racism. And But there have been multiple definitions that have been offered. And I think what is... Um, clear is that, um, and I think my colleague Zinzi Bailey writes this really well, um, I'll share her paper, but um, she describes it as being um, produced and reproduced by laws, practices and rules that are sanctioned um, by various levels of government and embedded in our economic systems as well as our, as well as our cultural and societal norms. Um, and so there are um, there are policies and procedures that are embedded in different institutions that are not individually led, but structurally led, that then impact someone's opportunity um, based on their race. Um, and I, and I, I don't know if that's the best way of saying it, but is I've just paraphrased um, um, her work there, but. I, I always, this is one of the things that is difficult when you've seen a lot of the narratives in response to the commission reports and then the feedback afterwards is like, do we actually really understand, um, you know, what structural racism is? But I think there are definite policies and procedures that influence someone's and are shaped, um, but that influence um, differential opportunity based on race. Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, so yeah, please. Um, I mean, th thanks for that definition, uh, um, uh, Vanessa. I, you know, I, th I thought it was really um, eloquently presented. I mean, I the way I understand structural racism um, is as a um, as the kind of the in, the in, the visible and invisible racism that that kind of shapes society, and it is social, it is cultural, it is uh, political, and it features in in all kind of areas of society, be that education, be that health, be that um, the police. Um, and it is the, you know, we, we start off from the premise that society is racist rather than looking for partic particular examples or particular problems. If you recognize that there is a, there is systematic inequality in how different groups progress throughout life and that it features and is progressed through, you know, as the child goes into school, goes into, throughout life, um, it's that recognition that there is racism at various levels and it characterizes different domains. Um, and I, for me, that's, that's my kind of understanding of what uh, structural and systematic racism is. So it would be social, cultural and political, as well as economic, of course. Thank you. Yeah, one of the uh, benefits of being a historian is that you don't have to be as focused on the defining concepts, and um, I'm very happy about that fact. And we've, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter if we say structural racism, systemic racism. The point is that's being alluded to is, uh, as Sadia said, the kind of the, 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 the wideness of it, right? And I, if I could refer again to Femi Adelaja, uh, one of the activists in the uh, United States, Croydon, his he wrote. You know, in Brixton, it's obvious when people it, in Brixton, people found it obvious when people were being racist. You know, police stopped you, used racist insults, you got beaten up. In Croydon, you might be unemployed, you might go for a job, you didn't get it, maybe you just didn't get it. And then after a year of getting rejected, you think, hmm, maybe there's something else to this. And that I think is the sort of idea of systemic structural racism, right? It's not the obvious in your face, easy to understand, it's the something that requires stepping back, thinking about more deeply, considering over time, 
and needs a different kind of change. You know, it needs a different kind of action. And linked to this, I want to push back because I know that people are unhappy. Some, some people are unhappy with the kind of avoiding the question of policy. But I think it's important that we acknowledge what position we're taking. I'm not taking the position of someone that gets invited in front of Boris Johnson and gives his position on what the government should do, government today should do. What does it mean to imagine ourselves not in that position, but in the position of activists who we've seen over the last few years have been over the last few years have been in the streets, have been taking action? Why do we have to imagine a policy that can be implemented from on high and not the activities that we can do ourselves? Um, as people in struggle, you know, I think that's a position worth taking. And I think when we're talking about systemic, structural, racism, whatever term we're using, that's the one that has to be taken. That can't be solved by one individual policy. And those policies can move things, can just move the problems around. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to sort of just uh, address the question around what representation means. I think that it fits in with this broader question around structural structures versus the individual. Um, and I think both everyone in the panel's made really sort of salient points about what we mean by structural racism, which is legislation, institutional practices, day-to-day -day discrimination combined to, to impact black and ethnic minority groups. It's this combination, these structures that influence the treatment of black and ethnic minority groups that we're talking about today. Um, and I think it's very clear that we can see this. We can see how uh, different advantages, sets of advantages at school and discrimination, experiences of discrimination at school uh, impact experiences in the workplace, impact how likely you are to go to university to get the job. And when you're at the job, how well you're gonna do in the job. And this is all to do with broader structures in place. Um, and on the sort of kind of question around individuals um, and, and their role, um, so is, is can Britain uh, have a problem with racism if uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is a brown man, for example? Um, I think it's really urgent and important that we use that same lens in understanding that question. That just because some brown or black people um, are able to reach uh, the sort of upper echelons of the cabinet does not mean that the cabinet is making decisions that will uh, positively impact black and ethnic minority communities in our society. Um, we need to be very aware that when we talk about change, we don't talk about uh, sort of individuals reaching high, the highest echelons. We're talking about systemic and structural change that starts from the ground up. Um, and that does not come from, from one person at all. Um, so that's just what I'd add on, on that particular question. Thanks, Alba. Yeah. Does anybody have any else to say oh yeah Shadia did I was just going to say I was just yeah. going to say that I think um Alba leads us to a nice place in regards to coming back full circle where you know as you just said you know just because somebody high within the government is has brown skin um and that's where that you know you have to again address and look at the intersections of people that you're you're talking about, you're engaging with, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but when it comes to defining structural racism um, and, and kind of giving a, a concrete, you know, dictionary definition, I think kind of the, all the responses, the fact that there is so many different responses in itself is telling of how, um, you know, how, how difficult it is to kind of not only define, but also unpick and, and address um, when the, there isn't one single definition um, that's agreed and, and understood um, by all. We all have an understanding. There, there's a similar agreement, but the definition, and, it, and, you know, interestingly, it's a definition that people want. It's the definition that would make the policy become policy and so on and so forth and kind of having an agreed understanding it seems is not is not enough um, to make a change and I think you know the term structural racism is just one thing um, there's, 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 there's many that we that still needs addressing and so on but I think just how that question got answered and the fact that all responses were different in itself is is a way of kind of 
demonstrating how difficult um, you know the conversation that we're having is. Can I just yeah. I just add on that? I think that this is a, one of the reasons that Lingaya's uh, systems literacy is a useful concept because when you read, when you are literate, when you read, you don't have dictionary definitions popping into your head every time you see a word. You know, you have a sense for what the words mean as you're reading on the page. You don't have to know the dictionary definition of every word. And some of our dictionary definitions would vary how we'd interpret them. Um, and I think that kind of literacy, sense of literacy is, is helpful here because it's that, uh, let's be familiar enough, enough, you know, it doesn't need to be dictionary ev definition, everything on the same page. It can be good enough. Thank you. And on that note, I think we'll wrap up. Thanks so much to all of our speakers, such excellent interventions. Thanks to everyone who posed questions and to all of you for coming. Um, you can find out more about the Milan Institute at qmul.ac.uk forward slash MEI, where you can sign up to the mailing list and find out more about our past and future events. Once again, thanks everyone for coming and taking part in this super important an ongoing discussion. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.